my recording. So welcome back everyone on Moodle as well. So normalization um, means, or uh, there's two different types of normalization. Uh, the first one is the normalization of ratings, um, which means that you adjust values measured on different scales to a common scale. Hey, right, so if you think about normalization of ratings, hey, if you think about a microarray, if you have two microarrays, uh, one has um, more DNA on it than the other one, then the entire intensity of the one array will be higher than the intensity of the other array, right? So you would do a normalization to bring these two distributions um, in, in line with each other, right? So you would take the array, which had too much DNA on there, and then kind of subtract a, 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 co a constant from each of these values and to bring the, the microarray back into the same scale level. That's the first thing of first part of normalization. So that is a very specific type of normalization and that's called normalization of ratings. And then you have another process which is normalization of scores. And normalization of scores is something which happens when you align your distribution to a normal distribution. So hey, imagine that I've measured um, intensity values. Hey, intensity values, if you scan stuff with, an, uh, with a laser, and then of course the intensity values will not follow a normal distribution normally, hey, and that is because um, the, the intensity um, will hey, in a lot of times be zero, like a, a lot of probes on the array will not catch any DNA, right, because these genes are not expressed, um, and the genes that are expressed will have very high values, right, they are, they are shining really bright, and so when you want to go from, uh, a, so if you look at a single microarray, and then the intensity values on this microarray will not follow a normal distribution, and so you would want to then change the distribution that you have to a normal distribution to kind of compensate for the fact that a lot of the genes were off uh, and only some of the genes will be on, and normally in a certain cell type you kind of expect uh, 10 to 20 percent of the genome to be expressed. You don't express, expect all of the genes in the genome to be expressed in every cell. Um, yeah, so these two types of normalization happen um, either simultaneously or you can do them in two steps in microarray analysis. Yeah, so generally when you do a microarray normalization, the first thing that you do is to normalize your scores to be a normal distribution and then afterwards hey, you go across the arrays and you, you kind of normalize using uh, a rating normalization to make all of the distributions more or less the same. Yeah, so normalization is nothing more than shifting and scaling the original values with the intention that the normalized values allow you to compare um, nor uh, corresponding normalized values for different data sets in a way uh, that eliminates the effect of certain massive influences. Okay, I hope that's clear. So hey, in microarrays, normally the, the score normalization is the log two transformation that we do on the intensity values. And then the next, the normalization of ratings is done by quantile normalization. Um, so how does this, that look? So hey, when we have um, our microarrays and we have log2 transformed the microarrays and then you can still see that every sample on every different microarray has a slightly different mean and you see that some microarrays they, they have also a kind of different distribution and this one has kind of a higher distribution and on the top we see that there's a couple of outliers and so we can get rid of this by saying we want to normalize between samples and so this is a rating normalization and to make them all similar, yeah, so, so that they all have more or less the same scale. Yeah, so this is after you do the log2 transformation because normally the intensity values on an array will be in the order of zero, right, not being expressed to like um, 20 to 40,000 uh, lumen, so 20 to 40,000 intensity. And of course this is not a normal distribution at all, but taking the log2 will make it a normal distribution like this, so how do you do that? for each array independently and then afterwards you do the ratings normalization which will then normalize all of these distributions to be in the same range. So in this case from like 0 to slightly above 15. Quantile normalization by the way is one of the most used normalization techniques uh, in, in microarrays. So the 
I told you about one of these issues that we had with um, the various behaviors of the different dyes, right? So here I have a, a, li a little um, example. Yeah, so we see that psi 5, the dynamic range of psi 5 is from like uh, 5,000 yeah, up to like 20,000, um, has sometimes 16,000. But yeah, the, the, the issue is, is that yeah, the psi 3 has a much higher intensity. And that is just due to the fact yeah, that the green color is much more intense than the red color in that sense. And so it, when you use two color microarrays, hey, you want to take the ratio. And so here we see a little example. And so we, for example, see that the psi 5 channel of the array had an intensity value of 5000. The psi 3 had an intensity of 40,000. And so when you look at the microarray, you see that this spot is green because there's more green than there's red. And of course, um, when both tissues express the, uh, or both samples that you colored express in almost the same, then you see that it's around uh, around 20,000 for each. Uh, but the thing is, is that this, uh, these scales, the dynamic range of psi 5 and psi 3 are very different. And so what you want to do is you then take the mean of the intensity 1 divided by the mean of the second intensity, uh, and then the, you get the ratio between them. So here you see there's one part psi 5 to eight parts psi 3. Um, but the, the, the issue here comes in is that if you look at a red dot, and then you see that there's eight parts of psi 5 and one part of psi 3. And so these are more or less their inverse. But mathematically, of course, going from 1 in 8 to 1 in 4 is a smaller step than going from 4 in 1 to 8 in 1. Right? So there's eight or there's four units between this while here there's less than one fourth or uh, there's like one one a fourth and an eight that's two eight so there's one eighth of a unit difference here and that that's one of these issues is that hey, because when you're dividing things if hey if you're dividing a by b and b by a and then of course these these ratios flip when you are when one of the two is higher so the range between zero and one is uh, the same or uh, is more or less comparable to the range of one until infinity at the other end and so to compensate for that you take the log two ratio so the log two ratio allows you to now have the same step size uh, because going from one to two is is a step of of one uh, going from one to four is a step of of three uh, but going from one to half is only step is only stepping by half a unit, going from ha uh, from half a unit to one fourth of a unit is also a smaller step. And so the, the, the ranges, if you divide two things, then it gets squeezed in the area between zero and one. And so to compensate that, you can take the log two ratio and the log two ratio makes it so that if you have a, a one, right? So both samples are equal, then now it turns into a zero. And if you look at a ratio of two to one, that becomes positive one and a ratio of one over two becomes negative one. And so now when you look at the, the last line, then you see that had the, the step size going from zero to one, going from one to two is the same in both directions. Um, and this is one of these kind of mathematical tricks as so to kind of prevent the squeezing of the numbers in this zero to one range on one side of the distribution. And so that is one of the reasons why, especially in two color microarrays, we would always lose a log two transformation of the ratio. Yeah. Like I told you, why express intensities as a log two ratios? Because there is a big, big imbalance. Had the the different intensity ranges. Had this imbalance is due to the two channels is known as die bias, and you don't want to have any die bias. Um, have because it just it has nothing to do with biology. It has just everything to do with like chemistry and how these dyes react to a laser light. And some dyes have a bigger dynamic range. So the log through transformation improves the characteristic of the data distribution. It makes it a more normal distribution. That's one. But it also allow it also prevents the squeezing of these ratio numbers between zero and one when one of the two is higher. And it allows us to 
often use classical parametric statistics for analysis compared to non-parametric statistics. Yeah, because if your distribution is not a normal distribution, you have to switch to using uh, non-parametric statistics. And non-parametric statistics generally are less powerful than parametric statistics. Yeah, because if you use parametric statistics, your assumption is, is that it's a normal distribution. And because of that, hey, you can do certain tests that you can't do when you don't have normal distributions. Yeah, it's the difference between between doing a t-test or a Wilcoxon sign brank test and the t-test is just more powerful because it knows something or it assumes something that the Wilcoxon test cannot assume um, so that's the that those are kind of the three main reasons why you want to log ratio your data if you have two color microarrays the log transformation of course on the normal single channel microarrays like i showed you here and here we do the here we just have a single channel a single intensity and we do the log to transformation just to make it a normal distribution so this is just for statistical reasons um, but hey, when we have two color microarrays we have another reason to do it um, and that is because of the the the, the, the dye bias of course if you have a single color microarray then there's no dye bias because every array is using the same color. So when you are looking at microarrays one of the most important steps in the f in the analysis of microarray is to do background correction hey, because you want to adjust for non-specific hybridization hey, because DNA will bind to DNA even though it is not perfectly the same right so even if there's like one or two mismatches hey, it will still bind and in the washing step you try to get rid of as many of these like non-specific bindings as possible but there is always some non-specific binding going on hey, even um, hey, even between s sequences which are completely not complementary they can get kind of stuck to each other and by trying to wash them off they just don't wash off exactly and so if you then look at the array what you see is that the whole array is kind of having a little bit of an intensity right the, the array if there's no DNA bound to a spot the spot is still a little bit lighter than the rest of the array next to it and so the hybridization of sample transcripts whose sequence do not perfectly match to those of the probes of the array it happens so you have to compensate for that um, so so in the old days non-specific hybridization could be estimated from the fluorescence level in the immediate vicinity of the probes um, hey, if you have a very big array from like 9 centimeters by 12 centimeters and that this is your microarray and then of course you could look around the spots to see how much kind of intensity you saw next to the spots but since spots became so small and are so close together you cannot really do that anymore so currently we use like an exogenous negative control spots and so if you order a human array there are some probes on there which come from plants so these probes are not supposed to work in human because these sequences do not occur in human so they give you kind of a negative control because you can look at the intensity of these spots that should not occur in humans and then these these um, these spots are used as the minimum value and so if if another spot has the same value as one of these plant spots then we can say well this is this is just non-specific binding um, another way of doing this is um, how Affymetrix does it so Affymetrix um, always has mismatch probes so if you make an array um, an Affymetrix array then the, these arrays they say well there's 50,000 probes on the array but actually there's a hundred thousand so there's for each probe that they put on the array they also put a probe which has a mismatch in there and then they look to see what the difference is between the, the perfect match probe and the mismatch probe to estimate the background level to estimate what the what the real intensity of a spot is and so there's two ways of kind of fixing that and in the old days when we still had the big arrays we fixed it by just looking around the spots um, but now we use an exogenous negative control there's often also an exogenous positive control so a spot which is always on um, and a spot which is then well should always be off at least on like human arrays and mismatch probes are another way of fixing this there's also some kind of spatial bias often in microarrays and this is just due to the fact that pipetting is not perfect 
right? The, the best way would be to have like a, a very kind of homogeneous in, uh, intensity on the whole array. But hey, if you are pipetting on an array, um, then of course you're pipetting either from a, a corner of the array or from the middle of the array. And of course, if you change that, so if one array is pipeted exactly in the middle and another array is pipeted at the side, and then you see these spatial bias distortions. Because of course the, the concentration of DNA will kind of be higher at the point where you pipe it in compared to the point where you did not pipe it but where it just flowed towards and so hey, it will start binding i think that that's logical right that if you if you take like a, a um if you if you look at like a piece of paper and you take a big pipe it with water and you you pipe it on the paper then at the spot where you are pipeting is much more intense or is much more wet than where the water flow to because the, the, the paper will just start absorbing it very directly and so what you can see here is for example hey you have three arrays where the pipeting happened more or less at the top of the array and you see that hey, there's a concentration difference more or less at the bottom of the array where there was just l less DNA compared to on top of the array and here hey you see that it's more or less kind of distributed across the array hey, but what you can then do is you can use spatial normalization techniques to say no I expected the top of the array to be just as intense as the bottom of the array hey, because there's no reason to assume that all of the genes which are expressed are located on the top and all of the genes which are not expressed on the bottom and so there's there's software that can allow you to kind of circumvent this spatial bias and make the whole array more or less a a uniform background, a uniform color. So if you want to do this, then you can look into Bioconductor. So Bioconductor has this AFI package to uh, analyze AFI metrics arrays. It also has an Illumina package to... Uh... Ooh, someone followed me. Thank you, Skorita, for following me. It, it still works. I, I like it so much that it still works. Um, and Bioconductor um, has these packages and they include like the best known algorithms for pre-processing microarray data. And so this, this spatial aberration and had the things that um, um, have to do with like a little hair because also there, um, hey, you can have a hair that is stuck on your microarray. Yeah, it's funny, right? That you get like this little sound effect and your name on the bottom. I, I thought that that would be funny for users so that they can have some feedback when they when they follow me. And also I get notified when people follow. Um, and so for single channel arrays, there are uh, different types of, uh, of normalization. Um, so there's a lot, um, or annoy you. Yeah, yeah, you could annoy me as well, but then it's very easy that I'm just pressing one button and then the sound goes off, uh, so. Um, so the single channel arrays have kind of three normalization techniques which are used a lot. So mass 5 is one of the older ones, it's not used that much anymore. Uh, you have the RMA, so the robust, robust microarray average, and you have GC RMA, which is compensating also for the GC content of the different probes. And so GC RMA stands for GC, which is the G con GC content of the probe, and this has to do of course be because of the fact that GC has three hydrogen bridges and AT only has two hydrogen bridges. Um, and when you do two channel arrays, then the standard normalization that people use is LOAS, so LUAS uh, normalization. And, and of course you can read up on which, which would be best for you, um, but in general nowadays people when they use single channel arrays they, they always do GCRMA normalization of the background and of the spatial effects and um, if you use two channel or two color microarrays uh, then you have uh, low S normalization. All right, so that's that's more or less all, everything that I want to say about normalization of microarrays. And, and of course, this is you can just look up a back best practices and uh, Bioconductor here is your friend. Uh, Bioconductor has packages for reading in cell files, normalizing cell files, and, and then writing them out um, onto disk in more or less a text format. Hey, but if you think about the statistical analysis, then the goal is to identify genes that are differentially expressed between groups of samples that you have. Now, for example, I've measured um, 
10 normal livers and I've measured 10 livers which have cirrhosis and so which are affected by, by alcohol use or other things and then I want to know what is the difference on the DNA level or not in the expression of the DNA level and so what I can do then is use many different statistical methods and the problem there is is that none of these methods is perfect right if you do statistics um, you're building a model and so you're saying that well I think that this is going on and then you can use all kinds of different statistical tests to kind of see which model fits best. So each test has different applications and it has different pros and cons. Um, but very normally if you have two groups then people will uh, use t-tests. Um, so t-tests work really well when you have normal distribution. Um, if you have more than two two groups, but these groups still follow a normal distribution, um, then you use an ANOVA test. Um, and rank products is very much used, and it was invented by the assistant professor of my previous group, so I'm always trying to push people to use rank product. Um, but rank product is a non-parametric method of doing t-test, so it's kind of a non parametric alternative to t-test and it works really well because it, it ranks things and then um, based on the ranking instead of the intensity values that you observe uh, it does test and it still it still retains a lot of power compared to a uh, Bill Coxon test um, yeah but of course all statistical models are wrong um, but some are useful and every statistical model has its own advantages and disadvantages yeah, so always when you do an analysis do your analysis using two different methods so to see yeah, if, if something comes up using different statistical methods yeah, if a certain gene is always the most differentially expressed gene and then of course um, you are more certain when you have computed this using three different methods and then when you only use one method to analyze your data. So the t-test compares the differences between two groups so hey, it's the t-test function in R it's just t.test um, and the thing with t-test is, is that there's a lot of variation in how you can do your t-test. Uh, but the major difference between t-test is the single-sided t-test, um, where you're saying that my hypothesis is that a gene in group A is lower expressed than a gene in group B. So this is a much more um, stringent test than the two-sided test, because the two-sided test says that I don't know what I have no hypothesis I just want to see genes which are different in group A compared to group B um, but hey, if you have a very good prior hey, for example you already know from previous experiments hey, that the gene that you are looking for is likely down regulated in one of the groups hey, then you would want to go for a single sided t-test because it will give you more power to detect effects uh, compared to a two sided test but the two-sided test, if you have no prior, eh, if you have no prior information and you're just doing an experiment for the first time, eh, then you're almost always forced to use a two-sided test eh, because you can't know if you're looking for a gene which is upregulated or if you're looking for a gene which is downregulated. The ANOVA is uh, slightly different, so the ANOVA in R um, is based on linear modeling, so you put up a model and this allows you to have like three groups or four groups or five groups um, but had the, the the power of the ANOVA is that hey you can compare differences between multiple groups for example different genotype groups like AA, AT and TT um, and it it allows you to do uh, quantitative differences so hey you and it doesn't really allow there's there's a lot to say about the ANOVAs ANOVAs are very powerful but the the biggest advantage which I didn't write on the slide is that the ANOVA can allow you to compensate for known effects and so if you know that half of your arrays have been scanned on Monday and another half of the arrays have been scanned on a different point in time and then of course you can you can give this information and you can give this batch effect information to the ANOVA and so that the first thing that the ANOVA will do is see if there's a difference between the groups that you specified and then it will use the kind of corrected data for the association test with the groups that you are interested in. And so in R, if you want to do this, you have to create a linear model first using the LM function, and then you can use the ANOVA function to test the significance of this linear model. Um, and so it all works with specifying a model saying, well, I think that the, the 
the expression of a gene is based on the age of the sample, so how old was the mouse or the human when we took the sample, and then I also assume that there's for example an effect of a certain gene or certain marker. So it allows you to, to include multiple things. And so multiple groups, and, and so not just two groups like the t-test, but you, you can do multiple groups and you can allow for covariates in your analysis. Things like the temperature, uh, the time of day, uh, the age of the sample, uh, the concentration of the DNA. And so all of these things you can put in your linear model and, and that will allow you to have a very... Uh, so it allows you to build up a, a hypothesis of what is going on in your data. And so a linear model looks kind of like this. So you have your response. In this case, the response generally is your um, your analysis of interest. And so in this case, it would be gene expression or the expression level of a gene is determined by some covariates. So and covariates are things like sex, age, weight, or food intake. Um, and then you have your predictor. And the predictor is the thing that we are investigating, right? So in this case, it could be um, disease tissue versus normal tissue or cancer tissue versus normal tissue or brain cells versus fat cells, right? So, and we're generally not interested in the effect that the age has on a certain gene expression yeah, because we're interested in what is different between cancer cells and normal cells. And so this is the kind of basics of a linear model. And of course a linear model will also allow you to have different interactions and these kinds of things, but have four the assignments today we will start building a linear model and, and the, it, it's too much to, to explain linear models in the context of uh, gene expression analysis. If you're really interested in for example doing linear modeling then uh, the R course that I'm doing in the summer uh, semester will have a whole it will have like three lectures about linear modeling and how to do it in R. And so what what how do you linear model when you have repeated measurements? How do you do linear modeling when you don't have normal distributions? Yeah, how, how do you deal with things like time series modeling? Um, so all of these things, um, had, like I have three lectures um, in, the, uh, in, in the R course about how to properly do linear modeling and, and what do the results mean. So hey, a little example of an ANOVA based on data that we collected here. So we have the B6, which is the reference mouse strain. We have our famous Berlin fat mouse inbred line, which is one of these mice which weighs like almost three times the weight of a B6, a normal mouse. And here we have an F1 group and the F1 group is, uh, is are the children of uh, a B6 mouse crossed by a BFMI mice. And in our case, we had multiple tissues. We had two different tissues measured. Um, and then we put up the model saying that the expression of a gene is based on the tissue that we measured plus the strain that we are currently looking at. And then I can use the ANOVA. And when I do the ANOVA, then I get this analysis of variance table. And it will tell me that there is a, a significant effect of the tissue, right? So this gene was differentially expressed between the two tissues that we were looking at, but it was not significantly expressed between the different strains that we were looking at. So every strain had the same expression level, um, but of course the gene is different when you look at brain tissue compared to, for example, liver tissue. So very basic introduction of, of an ANOVA. Um, like I said, like if you want to know more, you, you can ask me and we, like I can talk about ANOVAs and linear modeling for hours and hours and hours, but um, I don't want to do that today. So and depending on which statistical test you use, um, yeah, because that depends on the data, the amount of covariates that you have, the amount of groups that you have, the distribution that you have, there is a very significant issue when you are doing microarray analysis. Because when you are doing a microarray experiment, you are measuring like 10,000 or 100, well, not 100,000 genes because humans don't have 100, but you're measuring somewhere between like 10,000 genes and like 20 to 30,000 genes, right? Um, so you are doing thousands and thousands of statistical tests. And so the, the, the issue here comes in is that in biology, we agree on saying that, well, if the p-value is below 0.05, then something is significantly different. But of course, if we just generate random data and start doing and so if we generate two 
sets of random data so we just generate like a hundred random numbers and we generate a hundred random numbers from the same distribution and we do a test then this test will tell me that these two groups come from the same distribution 95% of the time 5% of the time the test will make an error right because that is our type 1 error rate that we agreed upon 0 0.05 meaning that hey if I just randomly generate two distributions and I do that a hundred times then five times the test will say there is a significant difference while there is actually not because hey, I, I generated it from the same distribution and so there's two two errors that occur when you when you deal with this and there's a type 1 error where you call a gene significantly changed so you're saying this gene is significantly upregulated but it is not significantly upregulated it's just by chance it's just due to the fact that we do so many statistical tests that this happens um, and you can avoid this by using uh, a Bonferroni correction um, and, and there's then also the type 2 error so the type 2 error is saying that this gene is not significantly different while it actually is so it, like and that's something that it is you can avoid as well and so when you do a statistical test you're always trying to optimize uh, the type 1 error rate or the type 2 error rate because if you if you start messing with uh, kind of the 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 way that you do your um, correction procedure like using Bonferroni um, and so if you do Bonferroni correction then you optimize to minimize your type 1 errors and if you do a Benjamini Hochberg correction, also called false discovery rate, um, or Benjamini Hochberg. There's a third guy sometimes that get mentioned because, like, they didn't invent it with the two of them. But hey, but if you if you do this kind of false discovery rate procedure, then you're optimizing for type two errors, meaning that you 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 don't optimize for type one errors. So the type one error rate goes up. And so if you're saying that I want to bring my type 2 error rate down, your type 1 error rate goes up. If you're t bringing your type 1 error rate down, then your type 2 error rate goes up. And so these are interchanged and, test, uh, and, and are uh, connected to each other. Um, but have for you guys know that the, the issue is, is that if you would test 10,000 genes, and you would just take your 0.05 significance level and then this would be an issue because out of 10,000 genes you would say that 500 genes are differentially expressed while they, they didn't, do not have to be differentially expressed it's just because your statistical test has an error and all statistical tests have an error so in R, we can use uh, the, the p.adjust function to correct our p-values and to optimize for a certain minimal error rate. And so we can, for example, use the Bonferroni correction and to optimize our type 1 error rate and to say that we want to prevent type 1 errors. And so we can adjust the p-value 0.0015 using the Bonferroni method. And then here in the, the third parameter is the number of tests that you did. So here we're telling the algorithm, well, we did 10 tests in total. So I want to adjust this value uh, based on the fact that we did 10 tests. And the, the, the 10 here, the number 10 here is the number of probes or genes that we measured on the array. And so this number is generally in the order of 10,000, 20, 30,000, depending on what type of an array you have. And but this makes a significant difference in, in, in the amount of wrongly differentially expressed genes that you claim there are in your sample. And because in the end, um, if you do a microarray, and you find a gene which is very different according to your analysis then hey you would go to the lab and you would use something like qpcr uh, to validate this and of course if you're not adjusting your p-values correctly then you won't confirm your differentially expressed gene because then in the qpcr so in a separate experiment hey you would try to redo this and figure out but then you would figure out that not if because normally if you would take if you would find that there's a hundred genes which are differentially expressed based on your microarray, if you then go to qPCR, then if you are a good statistician, then you want 95 or more of these genes to really be differentially expressed, right? So in the end, had the, doing a separate experiment to test what your error rate was on your microarrays, um, and you can do this with QTL mapping as well. And uh, always, when you when you do statistical analysis, it's good that someone in the lab confirms that your analysis was good, and good means that 95% of the things that you say 
should be able to validate in a lab. If it's lower than 95%, you did a bad job as a bioinformatician or as a statistician and, and you should feel bad. All right, so imagine now that we did all of this. So we did our microarrays, we did our normalization, and our background correction, and we did our linear modeling, and we have our differentially expressed genes, then we corrected for multiple testing. And then in the end, we have this list of differentially expressed genes, and then we can do multiple things with this. And so we want to, for example, look at if all of these genes share something, if they are all belonging to the immunity pathway, or if they're all belonging to muscle regulation, or if they're belonging to cell cycle, right? So to figure this out, we can use like things like gene ontology um, or CAG. And we already talked a lot about CAG. Um, uh, CAG is this database for the high level function and it provides maps. Um, but you can also use the CAG database to test if there is an overrepresentation of a certain pathway in your data, right? Because it might be interesting to know, oh, we, we look at um, livers um, from normal normal mice and, and heavily obese mice and now we want to know what's going wrong in the liver and just knowing that a certain gene is differentially expressed will not really help us pinpoint where things go wrong but using things like CAG we can figure out with which cellular pathway or which biological process is more than at random overrepresented in your data set and which will allow you to kind of reason what is going wrong within the different uh, within within your cells or within your different tissues. Um, we can also use gene ontology and gene ontology is a project a collaborative effort to address the need for consistent description of gene products across databases and um, it is an interesting project. Um, I, I'm not the biggest fan of gene ontology. I like CAG much more, but that's why we discussed CAG already a couple of times. Um, but gene ontology is something that people use a lot um, and it is well received, but I'm not really that big of a fan. I don't like the hypergeometric testing that they do, but that's something personal. And of course, like my personal opinion should not hold you guys to say well I, I'm not going to do gene ontology and gene ontology is a tool just like CAG is a tool to kind of figure out what's going on in your samples and in your experiments. Um, so gene ontology consists of three different parts so what they did is every gene in the genome gets annotated based on these three things so the first thing is the cellular component so for each gene in the genome, people started trying to figure out where is this gene located or where does it have its function. And so some genes are active in the nucleus, other genes are active in the endoplasmatic reticulum, other genes are active within the cytosol, some genes are actually excreted, so they are active in the extracellular matrix. Um, and so um, some genes, so, so every gene is annotated as the, the location where this gene is found to be active. And so there's a lot of information and experiments behind this to kind of figure out which cellular component a gene is active. And of course this can lead to overrepresentation. If you find that all of your genes which are differentially expressed are actually annotated as having a cellular component, mitochondria, then you know, oh wait, perhaps we should take a closer look at the mitochondria in our next experiment because that's probably where the, the thing which goes wrong is, is most active. Hey, if, if this cellular component points to the nucleus, hey, you can have a closer look at the nucleus. So it, it helps you to plan with your current analysis and with your current like differentially expressed set of genes to figure out which region of the cell something goes wrong. All genes in, the, in all genes in the genome are also annotated based on their biological process. So the biological process is a term that describes a series of events accomplished by one or more organized assemblies of molecular function. So a biological process is not really equivalent to a pathway, um, like a CAC pathway, but a biological process is something that um, is um, is more general. Right, like growth. Growth is is something that and it cellular growth or cell division. And those are not 
pathways in in itself right because a pathway is defined by having a a, a metabolite and then a, an, an enzyme working on that converting it to another one and so metabolic pathways are described as being like steps where hey you go from one substance to another substance through a step a no, number of steps of transformation hey, but biological processes are much more broad so they say like this is dna replication um, biological processes, I think we saw this in Reactome as well, right? CAG is really about um, looking at um, um, uh, metabolite, protein or enzyme working on it and then it turns into another metabolite hey, but the biological process is something like cellular component hey, and that, that are, uh, is something like uh, DNA replication or uh, growth or cell cycle, hey, so it's much more broad but of course, if you if you find a list in your list of differentially expressed genes that most of these genes have something that is annotated to, for example, cell cycle, and then you can kind of figure out or can you can kind of think like, oh, that's interesting. So there's probably something cell cycle wrong or there's something wrong in the cell cycle of these cells. Um, furthermore, we have molecular function. So again, every gene in the genome has a molecular function, and a molecular function describes the activity that occur at a molecular level. So it occurs, or it sort of corresponds to an activity that can be formed by individual gene products, but some activities are performed by assembly. And so a molecular function is much smaller. So a molecular function is much more like a, uh, a like a pathway. It's 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 very close to what a pathway does. So and molecular functions can be um, protein degradation. Um, hey, that's that's a molecular function. It's also more or less a biological process, but a biological process would not say it would say um, protein synthesis. Hey, so the degradation and the production of proteins. But hey, molecular functions are very close to pathways. Hey, so gene ontology is a tree. So if we look at the biological process tree, hey, then it is split out into cellular processes and metabolic processes. And then of course, hey, you have then an, an in the next group, hey, so in the next level, hey, things are annotated being part of a cellular metabolic process or a small molecule metabolic process. And this then gets split out into metabolic processes which have to do with vitamins and metabolic processes which are cellular and have to do with uh, ketone bodies. And for example, you can have cofactor metabolic processes. And this then splits out more and more and more in much more finer detail and finer detail. But all of these are a tree. Right, so uh, also the cellular component is a tree. So hey, it's like inside, outside of the cell, and when you are inside of the cell, you can be in the cytosol or in the nucleus, and when you're in the cytosol, then you can be in the in the plasma. And so it, it's always a tree um, that you're that you're looking at. And hey, of course, every gene gets annotated with one of these. And if you're annotated as being a metaquionine metabolic process, then you're also a vitamin K process, and you're also a ketone process. You're also these two, so and it's it, it works up, and it is very dissimilar to how CAC works because CAC works in in pathways. So, metabolite enzyme working on a metabolite, other metabolite is being produced. All right, so again, I've been talking for like forty minutes, and I'm gonna do a quick break, and then we have like. 15 slides left so we will do the 15 slides and then uh, we will talk about um, SARS-CoV-2 and downloading stuff from Ensemble in R and doing multiple sequence alignments on, on viral genomes um, which uh, Jan wanted to know something more about. Good so then um, second break is what was it? koalas yes so enjoy the koalas um, and I will be back in like five to ten minutes so I will see you all five to ten minutes and